Amen. Let's turn together to God, in God's word to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to read together the first eight verses of chapter 4, and we're going to uh, consider what we read in the Belgian Confession in light of what God's word teaches us in, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, the first eight verses. Uh, but before we open God's word together, let's ask him to bless it to us. So let's stand together and we'll pray that God would illuminate his word for us. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, our heavenly Father, we acknowledge that we are sinners conceived and born in sin, unable of ourselves to do any good. But we do repent of our sins and seek your grace to help us in our remaining weaknesses. And so through the teaching of your word, which we confess with the church throughout the ages, satisfy our hunger and quench our thirst with your refreshing truth, that we with all our hearts may love and serve you with our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the one and only true God who lives and reigns forever. Amen. Please be seated. And let's look now to God's word in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, probably very familiar words to many of us, 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, and let's pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Thus far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to us. Well, this is the third week we've spent together uh, considering this important doctrine of sanctification. Um, and we wanted to take the time to make sure that we properly look at and properly understand this very important doctrine in the Christian life. And we wanted to begin by understanding that that work of sanctification begins with a regenerating work of God in our lives, Him bringing us from death to life. That's His work that the Spirit does in us. It's God's work from beginning to end, salvation, including our sanctification. And it's important that we understand that, that we understand that's primarily God's work in us, to which we are called to respond, but it is God's work. And we thought about that together. Uh, we also wanted to understand the relationship between the good that we do and the free grace that God gives so that we understand that everything still is from the free grace of our God, that when he works faith in the hearts and souls of believers, it's impossible for that faith not to be fruitful, uh, for that faith not to bear fruit by the power of the Spirit, uh, that that's also a work that God does in us. That God works from first to last and calls us to respond, just as he does with faith. God works faith in us, but he calls us to respond with trusting in Christ. So also, God works obedience in us and calls us to respond with a life of thanksgiving to our God. Um, and so those are important things for us to, to work through, to really understand about good works and how our good works can be acceptable to God as they proceed from the godly root of the faith God has planted in us and how God sanctifies the good that we do so that what we do, despite its many weaknesses, despite its many perfections, is still sanctified by His grace. 
uh, that, the Holy, that the Holy Spirit is working in us and that Christ takes those works, that he works in us and perfects them before his Father so that they are truly good and acceptable in his sight. Now we can think like of those Old Testament offerings that God would say they're, they're pleasant smells before me, pleasant aromas in my nose. That that's how our good works now come to God from the Spirit in Christ. Um, but there's another aspect of sanctification that people often wrestle with and, and need, to, need help understanding. And that's these questions that are raised at the end of Article 24. How do we think of these works? Particularly when it comes to merit. Do these works earn us something from God? If they are good and acceptable, does that mean that somehow doing them earns us something before the Lord? Do these good works merit something? Um, and if they don't earn us something, then why does the Bible talk about God rewarding them? Um, we, we have that great hope that Paul has at the end of his life as he recognizes in this text we read that his life is being poured out like a drink offering and that he's come to the end of his walk with the Lord in this life and he's confident that he's going to receive a reward, that he's fought the good fight and he's finished the race, he's kept the faith and there's this expectation he has of this award, this crown of righteousness that God is going to award. And we, we can read passages like that. We can say, of course, I want that reward. And the Bible talks about rewards. And so if everything comes to us of free grace and we're not earning anything from God, then how do we understand those passages that talk about rewards? And those are the last two questions we really want to make sure that we understand uh, from God's word and as it's summarized by the Belgian Confession. How do Christians understand sanctification and merit? How do we understand sanctification and rewards? And finally, how do we properly understand sanctification and our hope of salvation? And that's the three ways we want to think through these things together this evening. Sanctification and merit, sanctification and rewards, and sanctification and our hope. That's how we want to think about these things together. Sanctification and merit. Um, this is a, an important thing. It's been important in every age of the church to understand this. Do we do something that puts God in our debt? Do we do anything that makes God owe us something? Um, and that's really what merit means. We sometimes use this word merit in theology, but it really just means earning something. Do you earn something uh, by what you do? And this was an important aspect of the church, what the church was dealing with at the time the Belgian Confession was written because there were a lot of similar ways in which the Reformed and Rome talked about sanctification, talked about good works, talked about grace, that to the uninitiated might sound like there wasn't a lot of difference. Um, because you could have said to a Roman Catholic, should good works be seen in the Christian life? And they would have said yes, and the Reformed would have said yes. Yes, good works should be seen in the Christian life. If you would say, do you insist that good works should be done? They would say, yes, we insist that good works should be done. And everybody would be agreed on that major point. Um, is grace necessary for good works? Both would have said yes. Um, and both would agree that God does reward good works. There were these broad points of agreement. And if you don't get into... The difference is, you could have been tempted at the time to think, aren't we both kind of on the same page? Are we really saying anything that different? But of course, as you worked out how this was thought of in the Roman church, how they came to some of these conclusions, it betrays that the differences were much greater than any broad points of agreement they had on these issues. Because Rome taught that good works contributed to man's salvation, that they were meritorious works, that they did earn something from God. And although they said, yes, divine grace is necessary to produce these works, they still said that when you cooperate with grace, you've made yourself worthy of it. That in a sense, it was a sanctifying grace that those who received it 
made themselves worthy of it. And they had ways of formulating this and saying, you know, to those who do what lies within them, God will not deny his grace. There is grace to be given, surely, but you have to make yourself worthy of it. Um, And there were those who were infused with this grace and cooperated with that grace. And you had to cooperate with it both before and after your justification. And so it's a way of saying, yes, grace is necessary, but you make yourself worthy of that grace. Um, You can make good use of that grace or you can waste that grace. But you have to make good use of it if you truly want to be saved. Um, And that's where they part ways, not only from what the Reform taught about good works, but more importantly, what the Bible teaches about our good works. Uh, One Reform commentator summarized Rome's view this way, although it is always to the grace of the Holy Spirit that we owe our works, According to modern Roman theologians, they are our merits, for we have not abused but cooperated with grace. The state of grace is not only a sanctifying state, but it also demands that we should earn the wages of supernatural life by our own labors. That's what they taught. You could earn the wages of supernatural life by your own labors. Another Reformed theologian put it this way, the Roman Catholic Church holds that after the sinner has received the grace of God in his heart, he can perform meritorious works. That is, works which give him a just claim to salvation and glory. Um, That you can be, you can put God in your debt, essentially, by the work that you do. Now, they would deny this, and I imagine any, ref- any Roman person hearing me describe it that way would want to stand up and object. Um, but the point of the reformers was to say, you can, you can play games with the language as much as you want. You can talk about grace in, your, in little ways. You can say how grace filled and grace infused and grace begun and grace finished, all these things are. But at the end of the day, what you do is you say that you can merit salvation. That part of it comes down to what you do, whether you cooperate with grace or not. And the reform looked at that, and they looked at that in light of what God's word clearly says about the free gift of salvation. And said, if you insert yourself into God's saving work, then you make Christ less than a full savior, and you rob him of his glory. Because the only reason we are saved is because of what Christ did and because of what Christ earned. And the minute I start to say that I did something to earn it, I am by that action robbing Christ of his glory. Um, They also said if you are going to ascribe that part of the sanctifying work of God to yourself, you're also going to rob the Holy Spirit of his glory and sanctification. Because you're going to say, not only does God sanctify me, but I sanctify me. And to do that is to rob God of his glory. Either in the saving work of Jesus Christ or in the sanctifying work of the Spirit he's sent. Now we know that Ultimately, no one can steal glory from God, that God's glory cannot be diminished by men. But when we say things that way, we're saying it the way God himself speaks in Isaiah 48, 11, when he says, I will not share my glory with another. I will not share my glory with another. And we have to take those words very seriously. That's why it's a very serious thing to make this kind of Roman error. And although it's maybe most formalized and spelled out in the Church of Rome, many churches make this kind of mistake. To say, in effect, God does part of the saving and you do part. Or God does some of the sanctifying and you do part. Um, But the truth of Jesus Christ as taught in his word is you don't need to do any of the saving because Jesus does all the saving. That you don't need to do the sanctifying because the Spirit does the sanctifying. 
and that that is the only thing that can allow a Christian to truly rest in God and can truly give God the glory for what he has done. And that's why the Belgian Confession presses home this important truth of Scripture. Why do we do good works? It's not to try to earn something from God. And that's what I think is so important as Paul considers this award that waits for him, even though he refers to the things that he has done in this life. Right? He says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Therefore there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. It might seem to someone reading that to that point that P Paul is arguing on the basis of merit. I've earned it after all, haven't I? I've run the race, I've kept the faith. Um... But that's not how he argues. He says, which the righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Why does Paul expect that crown of righteousness from a righteous judge? Is it because he's done all of those things? No, he says, why am I going to receive that crown? Because I've loved his appearing. It's the love for God that he has worked in me himself that is going to cause me to receive this crown. It's the working of God in me that has caused me to live and to work as I have lived and worked. I am not putting God under my, I'm not putting God in my debt by what I've done. I'm receiving these things from a righteous judge on account of the grace he's worked in me and the love he's formed in me, not because of my work. We do not merit anything from our God. And that's what the Belgian Confession wants to press home from God's word. Uh, we read towards the end of the Belgian Confession, so then we do good works, but not for merit, for what would we merit? Right? I mean, it almost, you know, we're probably maybe too reformed to react any other way. But when you say, you know, I can earn something from God. I can do something that will, you know, put God in my debt, so to speak. That God has to pay out. Because I've earned it. But that just sounds wrong in our, in our ears. Not only because we know so much of our own inability but also because we know so much about our God's generosity. He doesn't set before us a task that's impossible for us to try to earn something from him that we can't earn, rather that he freely gives these things. What would we merit? Rather, we are indebted to God for the good works we do, and not he to us. And why is that? since it is he who works in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And that's why we have to build on these ideas of sanctification. Where do good and acceptable works come from? They're produced from the godly root of faith and they're sanctified by God. Do I produce the godly root of faith in myself? No, that's a gift from God to us. Ephesians 2 is very clear about that. Faith is a gift. That means that anything that proceeds from my life in terms of good work is the work of God working in my life. Anything that comes out as good and acceptable only comes out as good and acceptable because it proceeded from that godly root that he planted and was brought forth and sanctified by him. It's only because we've been a, a branch and grafted into Christ who is the true vine that any fruit comes from us. Otherwise, we would just be a dead branch on our own, never able to bear anything. But it's God who's worked in us. It's God who has grafted us into Christ so that the life from that true vine flows out to the branches and bears much fruit. For apart from Him, we can do nothing. 
So you see how foolish it is to say, I have this fruit, Lord, that I've made. Say, no, that's, that's foolish. No more than you would take an apple and say, you know, I made this myself without the help of a tree, without anything else. I, I just generated this apple. Everyone say, are you crazy? You had to get that apple from somewhere. You can't generate that on your own. Um, it's the same thing with good work. You could never take good work and give it to God because the only reason you would have it is because he's worked it. It's he who works in us both to will and to work according to his good pleasure, thus keeping in mind what is written, when you have done all that is commanded you, then you shall say, we are unworthy servants, we have done what it was our duty to do. Um, even all the good that we do, if we loved God with our heart, whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loved our neighbor as ourself every moment of our lives, we would still only be doing what God already deserves from us. We couldn't come to, come to him and somehow act as if that was something extra or something worthy of, of praise in that regard. Um, we're totally dependent on God, and God wants us to understand that. First, so that he would be glorified and so that we would be comforted. That our God doesn't come to us as his people and say, I need you to do something for me. And unless you do something for me, I will not be happy with you. And isn't that what so often leads to, to fear and anxiety and uncertainty in the Christian life when we somehow feel like God is expecting something of me and I'm worried he's going to be disappointed. I'll never forget talking to a young man once where he he was really struggling with certainty, and he said, you know, he's a high schooler, and he said, you know, I hear all these things about calling us to live these, you know, loud and active lives for God, and I feel like I believe in Jesus, and so I'm saved because that's what God's word says, but I'm afraid that I'm not living this kind of loud, you know, productive Christian life that some people are putting on me, and so I'm afraid that God is going to let me into heaven because he kind of has to, but he's not going to be happy about it. And, you know, he didn't, you know, articulate that cleanly and that clearly as I've just done it. That's my summary. But I was so heartbroken by that. Because God, that's not what God wants for us, to make us feel like we're just going to scrape over the finish line if we do absolutely enough to make him happy. That he's, you know, as I've said it before, as someone said, he's like a drill instructor, just in your face saying, not good enough. Is that the kind of God we serve? Or is he the God who comes to poor, miserable sinners and looks at us and says, you can't save yourself. If I ask you to do anything, you'll fail. And so because I love you, I'm going to do everything that needs to be done. And I'm not going to set you a task. I'm going to set you a promise. I'm not going to give you marching orders. I'm going to give you a gift. And that's what the glory of the New Testament tells us over and over again. This is a gift that has come to us from a God who has always shown himself to be nothing but a generous, open-handed God who sympathizes with our weakness, who knows our frame, who remembers that we are dust. And who comes to bring dust to glory. Think how often Paul uses the word free gift when he talks about salvation. Think of this passage from Romans 5 verses 15 through 18. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned 
through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. What is Paul doing there? He's comparing what we've earned with what God has freely given. And saying what God has freely given is not like what the first man earned. He earned death. But in Christ, you've been given the free gift of righteousness and life. That's the well-known comparison Paul makes in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What you earn by sin is death. What you're given in Christ by free gift is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. And not only does Paul assert that in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that salvation is by that free gift, but he asserts also it is not by works. The works are not to be brought into this consideration. He says that in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of works. Do you think Paul wants to make himself understood there? It's by grace that you are saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see how clearly he wants us to understand you've been given a gift. That gift will produce fruit. That's what it's designed to do. But don't think that you're trying to earn something from God by your works. That's to turn the the thing entirely upside down. We're told in 2 Timothy 1.9, God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. It was a gift that was even given before you were around to even think about a good work. It's a gift. Or Titus 3, 5, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Our good works cannot earn something from God because we are entirely indebted to God for the good that we do. We owe our whole lives to God. And we can't expect something more from him because we give him what he's due. Our good works are entirely dependent on the strength God gives us to do them. And even when we see them in our lives, we can't claim credit for them. The same Paul who said, you know, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith, is also the same Paul who said in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. He's clear, how am I this way? It's by the grace of God that I am what I am. And whatever I've accomplished by the work that God has given me to do, I've accomplished it in the power of his grace. We know we can't earn anything by our works because even the best of our works is imperfect. It's shot through with sin as we considered last time. We all stumble in many ways, the word tells us. Our Our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. And even if all that weren't true, as, our, as our, all that that we've said that our theologians have pointed out, even if all of that weren't true, can you really do something that would earn for you eternal glory? Is there anything that we do that's worth that kind of payout on a strict rewards, on a strict merit standard? Is there anything we do that we would expect God to come to us and say, you know, you've done so well. 
You know what you've earned? Eternal glory with me. You've earned life forever and you've earned the right to everything that belongs to my son. Do I think I really could stand before God with my handful of pitiful little works and expect to receive that return? Why do I receive that return? It's because I don't stand before him with my handful of pitiful works. It's because I stand before him clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's worthy of that reward. And that's the good news of the gospel as God gives it to us. He says, you don't need to do anything to earn your salvation. Because I've already sent a Savior who did everything that was necessary for your salvation. Jesus Christ is the one who comes into the world and does all the earning. He's the only person who ever walked into heaven in his own merit. Because he deserved to be there. Because he had perfectly kept the law of God in our place all his life and died for sinners. And G. Campbell Morgan said he's the only person who's ever walked into heaven by his own merit and in the light of heaven cast no shadow there. Such was the brightness of his holiness and glory. And he says everything I have is yours and it's my gift to you. Put your faith and trust in me and all that is mine is yours. All of his suffering, all of his death, all of his merit become ours. Jesus did the earning for you. So that you would not have to live a a life trying to earn the salvation of God. Jesus did that for us. That's why when we think about our sanctification, we never think about merit or something that we are deserving of from our God. Our works can't earn us anything and they don't need to. Because Christ has earned all that we need. And so then what do we mean when we talk about rewards? Um, How do we think about rewards then? Because doesn't God promise to reward us for the good that we do? And that also is clearly taught in Scripture. Uh, Paul talks about the awarding of the crown of righteousness, as we read. Uh, Jesus spoke that way in Matthew 5, 11, and 12. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Uh, what we read in Hebrews eleven six, And without faith it is impossible to please him forever who would ever draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And so we agree with Scripture that God certainly does reward our good works. But then we have to ask again, is he rewarding us because we've earned a reward? Or does he give us rewards the same way he gives every other gift? Not because we've done something to earn them, but because that's the kind of generous, gracious God that he is. So I love the statement of the Belgian Confession. We do not wish to deny that God rewards our good works, but it is by his grace that he crowns his gifts. Um, And that is just, again, the way of our God. We don't get rewards because we've taken the lead in obedience to God. We get rewards because God has taken the lead in freely and graciously giving us all things. And if he keeps this free gift on top of all the other free gifts, why would we be surprised? Why does he love us? Because of what's in him. Because that's the kind of God he is to have compassion from before the foundation of the world. Why does he give the gift of faith? Because that's the kind of God he is. He's a generous God who gives gifts. Gives the gift of his Holy Spirit. Why would we be surprised that God also rewards his own gifts? That out of his grace, he gives on top of giving. That's the God he's always revealed himself to be. A generous, open-handed God who desires the happiness of his people. And wants us to be blessed and gives grace on top of grace. 
Um, rewards are just another wonderful display of his remarkable generosity to us. That we would, you know, as, as Jesus talks about, that we would suffer and know that the only reason we're surviving the suffering is because of the grace of God at work in our lives, that God would then turn around and reward that out of his grace. It's just another testimony to the, the generosity of our God. That he's an open-handed God. That's what his whole creation has always been telling us. From the very beginning, man was put in a garden that was filled with good things. Filled with trees that were good. God is a, a generous, open-handed God. God shows that when he's a saving God to look around and say, you know, I looked and, and I thought, who's going to stand up for these people? And I looked around, there was no one to save them. And so I saved them. That's the kind of God he is. Unfailingly generous, and he rewards even those things that we are dependent on him for. That he crowns his own gifts out of his wonderful grace. God is a God who never stops giving to his people. He's never a God who comes to us and says, you've had enough. If ever we come to him and say, we need more, Lord, he says, well, then you may have it. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God who rewards even those who know they have nothing they've not been given. And that's why we don't have to worry about rewards either in the Christian life. Um, because we can be confident in that gracious act of God just as much as we are confident in every other gracious act of God given to his people. And that's why our hope in sanctification should never be drawn from our own good works. Um, God certainly does give us the merit we need in Jesus Christ. God certainly does reward us out of grace, but we should never put our hope in how our sanctification is going, in the good works that we're doing. And that's the thing that we always have to come back to. The Belgian Confession concludes with this important thought. Moreover, although we do good works, we do not base our salvation on them. For we cannot do any work that is not defiled by our flesh and also worthy of punishment. And even if we could point to one, memory of a single sin is enough for God to reject that work. So we would always be in doubt tossed back and forth without any certainty and our poor consciences would be tormented constantly if they did not rest on the merit of the suffering and death of our Savior. The only certainty in this world that we can find is in the finished work of Christ. That's the only thing that will give us comfort and will serve as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. To look to anything else, especially to look to things that we have or do, is going to be a sure path to doubt and uncertainty. And we all have known that struggle in the Christian life, I think, of falling into that trap of looking at my faith and saying, do I believe enough? I know that you're saved by faith, and I know that faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains, but do I have a faith even that big? Is my faith enough? And you start focusing on your faith instead of the Savior you take hold of by faith, and as you worry about your faith, you say, I'm not sure my faith will hold up. I'm not sure it'll pass the test. Or we begin to focus on our good works, and even though that we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we we see the meager kinds of fruit that we produce sometimes and we look at it and we say, is this the kind of thing a Christian would be doing? Shouldn't I be living a much more fruitful life? Um, and, and if this is all I can do before God, I, I hope that he lowers the bar enough that I can get under it because I don't know that I'm going to make it. That's a perfect recipe for doubt and uncertainty. To look to your good works or to look to your faith or to look to anything else but always looking outside of ourselves. The only way to find certainty is always to turn those questions around and say, is my faith enough? If that's all I'm going to look at, I'm going to be uncertain. 
mean, if you look at your faith and think it's enough, you have another kind of problem. Come see me after. Um, you're deluded <laughs> about the strength of your faith. Same thing about our works. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a meager kind of thing to say, well, I've tried to be a good person, and I hope that'll be enough for God. When we look to ourselves, we're not going to find the things that can comfort us and make us certain in the midst of this world where we are so tossed about. The only thing that can give us strength is if I don't look to my faith, but I look to the one in whom I put my faith. When I look to Jesus and I say, is there something he failed to do? Is there something he can't do? Am I beyond his helping? Am I beyond hoping in him? Those are questions we can answer with a lot of certainty. Jesus' arm is not grown too short to save. There's nothing lacking in his sacrifice. Nothing lacking in his power over death. He has conquered. We put our faith and our trust in him. And I don't have any merit that could, I can hope to present before God and be acceptable in his sight on my own. But Jesus has a perfect life, a perfect righteousness. And when I look at my life and say, you know, my good works are fairly pathetic and I'm not sure I would want to try to stand on them before his judgment seat, God says, that's okay, I've given you a Savior who's given you his righteousness. And that in him we've become the righteousness of God. That's a righteousness that will last. That's a righteousness that will stand the test. That's a faith and a good work that's provided to us by God as a free gift. And that's why Paul can say those things with confidence that he can say about not only himself but many others who've loved Jesus and long for his appearing, who have no hope apart from him. Trusting in him and looking to him for all that we need is the only way to avoid doubt and uncertainty. To not have those poor, tormented consciences that the Belgic Confession talks about. But rather to look to Christ and what he did by his perfect life and his sacrificial death and his glorious resurrection and to look to him and not find doubt and uncertainty to find what the writer of Hebrews calls strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Hope in Christ. No one who hopes in him has ever been put to shame. And Lord willing, we will all receive that crown of righteousness when he appears, not only with Paul, but with all those who love him and long for his appearing. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercy to poor sinners. We thank you for this word that you've communicated once again to us to assure us that Christ has done all that is necessary for our salvation. That anything you ask of us, you give to us. Um, you give us beyond measure what we need. Thank you for giving us gift upon gift. We think of all of the gifts that you continue to shower on your people and we stand in awe of your generosity and goodness towards sinners. That you would bring us from death to life and make us new creatures in Christ. That you would give us hearts of flesh to believe in you, ears to hear, eyes to see Jesus. That you give us faith that we might cling to him and understand what he's done. That you give us your spirit so that he might work in us and conform us to the image of your son. That you see to it that that work will persevere in us and that afterward we will see glory. Thank you for reminding us once again that by your grace we are what we are. And that nothing we have is not given to us by you. Lord, help to keep us from looking to our meager faith or our meager works as our hope. But always to look to the, the strong Christ our weak faith takes hold of. And to look to the merit of our Lord who gives us his righteousness. 
that we might be perfectly righteous before you. Help us to have that certainty. Help us to have that hope. And may we praise you always for the gracious gifts you shower on your people. Righteousness, reward, hope in life. We praise your name. Hear us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and hear God's parting benediction. Dearly loved brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, lift up your hearts to the Lord and receive now his blessing. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be and abide with you all. Amen. People of God, go in peace.